morning, everyone. And welcome to day two of the Association of the United States Army's annual meetings. Everybody having a good time so far? Or is it living up to your expectations? You guys don't sound very motivated this morning. I'm going to turn you over to SMA. He's going to be upset if you don't get motivated. All right, let me hear it for AUSA 2022. There you go. Welcome to the Sergeant Major of the Army's Professional Development Forum. I am Dan Daly, Sergeant Major of the Army, retired. As a reminder, please turn off and silence your cell phones for this forum. Let me begin by welcoming our distinguished guests, beginning with our host, the 16th Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael A. Grinston. We have a few other distinguished guests with us today. Joining us is our former Sergeant Major of the Army, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack Tilly. Do you want me to cue you again, Jack? Is... Okay. All right. Let's do it one more time. The 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack Tilly. Okay. Thanks, Jack. The 13th Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Army, Ken Preston. The Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, Tony L. Whitehead. <laughs> to our non-commissioned officers, distinguished guests, officers, and leaders, thank you for being with us here today. Before we get started with our panel today, we'd like to take a brief moment for a special presentation. Each year, the Association of the United States Army will award more than $325,000 through 44 national-level scholarships. One of these is the Sergeant Major Leon Von Autry Scholarship. Eight SMA Van Autry Scholarships are available, one at $25,000, one at $10,000, one at $5,000, and five at $2,000 for each scholarship. Through a generous contribution from USAA Foundation, the SMA Leon Van Autry Scholarship honor the mem memory and legacy of Sergeant Major of the Army Leon Von Autry. These scholarships embody SMA Van Autry's commitment to highly motivated and educational professionals by providing support to those who dedicate themselves to service to the nation and pursuing self-improvement. At this time, I'd like to invite Command Sergeant Major Retired Bob Weisenreich and Command Sergeant Major Retired Troy Welsh to the front of the presentation for this year's $50,000 donation. USA's annual donation of $50,000 to the Sergeant Major Vian Lanatri Scholarship Fund. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a big round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the theme of this year's panel is Training the Army of 2030. At this time, I'd like to turn over the floor to the 16th Sergeant Major of the Army, SMA Michael Princeton. is you get to torture somebody else with questions today because I'm actually not in the panel. So I'm going to sit down and I'm going to enjoy it. So I want really, really hard questions for all the panel members. Um, this is, first of all, this is what a great turnout. And I just want to say I really appreciate it. And we're going to talk about training, specifically NCO training. So this is really important. And we're going to have you know, TRADOC, Force Com, Army National Guard, Army Reserve, Sergeant Majors up here, and Army Futures Command to kind of talk about this. And uh, Sergeant Major, or Mr. Mansker, will introduce those panel members here in a minute. But I just want to talk about this. We talk about the theme is 2030, and we just rolled out a new multi domain operations 3.0. Uh, um, but most importantly, we have FM 7.0. And we've got hard copies in the back uh, of the room. If you don't have a copy, uh, they're going to be at one of the tables in the back, or we'll be handing those out. 
the priority should go to the, the, the NCOs, the young NCOs, um, platoon sergeants, uh, but if you want a copy, we've got some copies in the back, and we'll make sure you get to that. This is how we train. So when we say we've got the greatest army in the world, and we've got great officers, and we've got these great things called NCOs, and people don't really understand what we do, and sometimes we don't understand what we do, but it's in our doctrine. It's written right there. And the reason we're so good is that what we do as a non-commissioned officer is actually grounded in our Army doctrine and how we train. So if you haven't read that, you need to read it. You're not doing your job. And so you need to read Army doctrine and say, okay, what has the Army told me that I am responsible for in our doctrine? Uh, and that's what the panel is going to talk about today. And one of those things we had, we had doctrine in 2016, and we rolled out a new manual, 7.0 in 2021. There was only really four principles of training. And originally there was 10, then there's four, and now we went back, I think it's 10, 11. But in there, when General Rainey was CAC, and Sergeant Major Helton was going through this a little bit too when he first got there, is I was adamant that we had to bring right back in the principles of training, not Officers and NCOs, no. Specifically, the comment is NCOs train individual crews and small teams. Full stop. Your responsibility by Army doctrine. Do not give your authority away. So when you're doing PT and you're not leading that PT session, is that a small team or crew? Yes. Okay, who should be, by our doctrine, who should be training that event? You should be, the NCOs. Um, but right after that paragraph, it does talk a little bit, and it says, here's what NCOs should do. Um, just a few of them. I'm not going to read it, so hopefully you can read the manual. Identify and train soldier crews and teams. Just talked about. Train and enforce standards. By Army doctrine, it says NCOs should train and enforce task standards. And it didn't say just to the enlisted people. I'm just telling you, this is our Army doctrine. And it says, train and enforce task standards. Develop junior non-commissioned officer and help officers develop junior officers. This is your Army doctrine. Assist in planning, resource coordination, support risk mitigation, supervision, and evaluation of training. So that's just a few of those things. But again, I'll encourage you to read it. And when somebody says, well, I'm going to do this, you just pull out the manual and go, okay. It's my responsibility. And you should take that and say, no, nope, this is what I'm going to do for you. Um, and now, as I close and I'm getting ready to get to the panel, I want to, my favorite comment, the don't do it statement. So that's what I'm calling it. So um, when we're at the maneuver conference, I think most people forgot the whole scenario. The scenario was the platoon leader stood up and asked the chief and I a question. And it started off like this. I'm in the motor pool. I am changing a tank engine. And I was told to stop changing the tank engine and go do online mandatory online training. And I said, don't do it. Like, why would you do that? And I'll go back and ground in doctrine, because right after that I said, you should prioritize your training. I didn't, you know, immediately say, yep, no more online training. It's like, I know that's what you wanted, right? But how much online training, mandatory online training is in the Army? Like mandatory, must do, how many hours is that? I'll give you a coin. What do you think? I could ask the best squad what do you think about 10 hours 12 hours 24 oh not because your internet is bad <laughs> okay what do you think how many mandatory that's not it what you got there you got going you don't want to guess nope first arm what do you think you do it every year. It's mandatory. Mandatory online training. 300 hours. 
I don't know what you're doing in your unit. You're close. Okay, come on up. Two hours. Okay, so in other words, read your doctrine. So what I really want you to take away when you do training is chapter 2 of the manual says prioritize your training. That's what you have to do. Um, and if you're doing all these things, are you doing your job as a non-commissioned officer and training your leaders on how to prioritize training? And it's in your doctrine. I'd ask you to read that because it, you would probably not reading your own doctrine if you're stopping to do the chank engine, uh, to do mandatory online training when there's only two hours of mandatory online training that the Army's actually told you to do. And I think we got a priority in training if that's the case. So I look forward to the comments, the opening comments, and really good, hard, tough questions. And I love talking about training, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here just to say awesome and let's go. If I get the panel members to come up. If you're along the back wall, you're actually impeding people to come in here. So if you would, please move forward to your chairs while the panel members get in place. If you stay standing, you will get the questions. All right, good morning. Hey, what an honor it is to really introduce this, this panel up here. And they're going to talk about one of the most important things, if not the most important thing in your life, to, in training of our soldiers. So to your far left, my right, Sergeant Major Sims, Force Comm Sergeant Major. How much did he pay you? Sergeant Major Raines, Army National Guard. Sergeant Major Lombardo, Army Reserves. Sergeant Major Hendricks, TRADOC, and Sergeant Major Hester, Army Futures Command. Without further ado, we're going to go right to Sergeant Major Sims to kick this off, but let me just give you a little bit. If you want to ask a question, we'll go to Q&A after 30 minutes or so when they're speaking, depending how long they speak. There's mics available on the sides. You can also, there's cards running around. You can put the question on the cards and I will give it to them. Candidly, those are probably some of the best questions because they have time to think about their answer a little bit longer, and, uh, and I'll, I'll hand it to them and do it that way. So with that, Sergeant Major Sims. Cool. Thanks. Hey, so I will defer all my questions to the Sergeant Major of the Army. Ah. I'm just kidding. So, hey, but before we start, I want the, the, all you Warriors, the best squad team, stand up. I want everybody to give these guys a freaking big round of applause. Yeah. You get, you sit down. Hey, so I, I'm going to ask one question before I start. Why do we exist as an army? Anybody? Right, the fight and win our nation's wars. And, and those warriors right there are the reason uh, we exist as force comp, to ensure that we're training those folks, except for the, except for the ranger guys. But, you know, we're training those guys to uh, be ready to fight and win our nation's wars. So, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover a little bit of uh, what, what I'm supposed to talk about, then I'm going to talk about uh, what, what I've seen at our training centers. So, uh, it's all about empowering leaders. So if you read the doctrine, just like the SMA was talking about, I mean, I highlighted some points in there, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to repeat it, but it, it's about that. Engage leadership, leader presence and personal example at all levels. So a, as a SAR major, thinking about all the way back when I was a team leader, you know, I was, I was responsible to take care of, of that team. And uh, that means sustainment. That means taking care of, you know, getting, getting beans, getting bullets, get, doing the stuff for, for, for the team all the way up to this level. So uh, my mission as I go out is to ensure that I'm providing that leadership for Forces Command. When I go down to a, a say I go visit 20 Seaburn, if they need something, I'm engaging with that, uh, my staff, our staff at Forces Command to ensure that they get what they need. And uh, a, a big thing in Forces Command we're looking at is uh, leader stability. So if you're there and you build a team, why are we going to PCS 
you away from that that uh, that place. We need to keep you in place and to ensure that uh, we can accomplish the mission and, and deploy, fight, and win. And uh, in investing in our people, sustain the holistic health and fitness of our Army. So there, there's a lot of things, you know, TRADOC uh, is uh, very instrumental in helping forces command to ensure we have a healthy force. All right, it's all about winning the first fight. Uh, we exist, like we said, to fight and win our nation's wars. So you're going to start seeing a focus and a shift in forces command as we focus as division as that unit of action. All right, so a little bit of change to what we're doing. If you've seen the, the, the cake thing, uh, the, the chief talks about the, the, how we uh, balance uh, what we're, where we're training. But we're going to start uh, seeing a little bit more ramp up with our divisions. All right, so brigades and battalions must synchronize warfighting functions at their level. CTCs, I'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, fires. Listen to what I'm saying, fires, sustainment, and protection. We're seeing a fight unfold right now, and we're seeing how important fires is, and we're seeing how important sustainment is. So a as a SAR major, going to the CTCs and watching our units go through this uh, crucible at uh, Fort Irwin and uh, at uh, JRTC in Fort Polk, uh, there's a gap in, in what we're doing as the NCOs, and we have to ensure that as a non-commissioned officer, Reading our doctrine, 7-0, seven, seven you have to understand what your responsibility is. So fighting first sergeants, fighting sergeant majors, you know, that, that was cool in the past when uh, you know, we were uh, doing coin fight. But in LISCO, you have to be focused to ensure you're sustaining your force. So and I'm looking forward to questions about that. And uh, modernization, rearm, uh, we can talk about that uh, as well if you got any questions on it. But uh, you know, think about our CTCs. Our CTCs are modernizing too. All right, so w when you go down there and you face that world-class Op 4, you know, you're going to see uh, drone uh, swarms. You're going to see, you know, they're going to fight with fires, and you're going to actually have to work very hard at casualty evacuation and, and things like that. So it's important to understand that. But balance is a total army. I got my two partners from uh, Compo 2 and Compo 3. They, pro they provide us strategic depth and operational uh, capacity. So I, I, I can't wait to hear uh, John and... Uh, and Andrew talk, but uh, I, I can talk for days. I'm not going to, uh, but I'm going to pass it off to Sergeant Major Reigns. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, how many guardsmen do I got in the room? Hey, hey, we need to go back to uh, SMA Tilly. How many guardsmen do we got in the room? Good All right. So, hey, who are we? 336,000 soldiers across the 54 states, territories, and District of Columbia. So, so that's what comprises uh, your Army National Guard. So when we look at what we make up of the Army combat power, 49% of the maneuver force comes from the Army National Guard. So, so how do we get that force ready for, for the missions at hand? You know, and, and it's in the 7-0, which is what we've been uh, tasked to talk about today. So before I get started, I'm going to get started with a little scene setter. But i got to put my eyeballs on so I can read you the scene setter. Because all of our Sark Major Academy graduates in the room know that we got to give a credit. So, uh, or, or we'll go to jail. So, uh, hey, uh, Charles McEnany titled Multi-Demon Ta Task Force, A Glimpse of the Army of 2035. Three decades absent a nation able to challenge the United States after the dissolution of the Soviet Union are over. Tectonic shifts in geopolitics, namely the rise of China and the resurgence of Russia, coupled with rapid technological advancement, could make the United States' next war unprecedented in its speed, lethality, and reach. So speed, lethality, and reach. What do these say about the future fight? Leadership at the point is critical, so that's NCOs. Unimaginable violence, psychological demands can be overwhelming with the rigors of modern combat and technical specialization, high-tech equipment that require maintenance in an environment where operations do not stop. Uh, sound familiar? But I think my mind, limit, my mind limits me on the ability to truly comprehend based off of my past experiences. Being honest with myself, I haven't been in this kind of high-end, multi-domain fight. So I'm going to read some terms to you. Multi-domain task force, joint all-domain operations, joint all-domain command and control, multi-domain effects battalion, strategic fires battalion, direct energy battery, drone swarms, all-domain operations, joint interorganizational multinational spectrum, anti-access, anti-area denial, long-range hypersonic weapon, precision strike missile, strategic long-range cannon. Do I know what half of this list is even talking about? 
You know, this is the challenge I see in the Army National Guard. We got to educate ourselves, you know, and, and we got to take the time out to educate ourselves. Sergeant Major of the Army got up and he talked about 7.0. And when he talks about 7.0, he's talking about our place as NCOs in training ourselves. But in order to do that, the first foundational piece is to know what you're talking about and to be educated on, on the threat and to be educated on your equipment and your capabilities. And, and I think that is our challenge that we see going forward with the speed of modernization and, and finding that equipment in our formations. So how do we adapt as an Army National Guard to ensure NCOs are trained properly within the new doctrine? The KISS answer is we get better at what we should have been doing all along. Um, and Mr. Mansker uh, and the team put a slide up on, on the uh, screens over there. So when you look at that, you know, training time and resources, uh, right at the center of this slide, we always seem to be short on both in Compo 1. Now just think about Compo 2 and 3. 50% of our units are 39 day a year units. The others are between 55 and 75 uh, days a year. So this pyramid is all about multi-echelon training, right out of 7.0. Train using multi-echelon techniques to ma maximize time and resource efficiency. The Army fights as a team, and whenever possible, trains at echelon as a team. Additionally, the simultaneous training of multi-echelons on complementary tasks is the most efficient and effective way to train because it optimizes the use of time and resources. With only 39 to 75 days a year to accomplish all tasks, not just training, the Army National Guard has to use principles of training and have a solid plan that all leaders and soldiers understand. The expectations of NCOs across the Guard is it, right on the screen as well. Focus on individual and small unit training to develop masters of their craft and maximize time for subordinate leaders to build cohesive and lethal teams. So I won't read the slide to everyone for a few reasons. I know everybody here can read, and, uh, and two, we already know these things. If you look out to the right of that pyramid, it's what we should have been doing all along. So, you know, uh, there's no good answer to how we get after this question. You just have to make time and figure it out to make it work. Now, where is the work-life balance in that? Because that's what we hear all the time, right? Make it work. So what's that mean for a guardsman in that statement? Uh, it means they're probably going to do it outside of a drill weekend, and they're going to do it on, on, on their own dime, so they're not getting paid for it. So we know that that's not the right answer, and that's our challenge. How do we figure out that piece and manage the time available to be trained to the high enough level that our country expects us to be. So the answer, multi-echelon. And that's what we have to relearn that skill and spend the needed time at the base of the pyramid to gain enough proficiency to train at the higher level. We don't need squads present to train a battle staff. Um, you know, we don't need squads present to do a lot of those kinds of higher level things. So, so we just need to get back to multi-echelon concurrent training, and that's how uh, we'll answer or we'll solve this problem set. So thank you for the time. We look forward to the questions and answers, and I'll turn it over to my brother from the U.S. Army Reserve. Hey, thanks, John. So good morning. So the United States Army Reserve is the dedicated Federal Reserve of the Army. The mission of the U.S. Army Reserve is to provide combat-ready unit, units and soldiers to Forces Command to enable the joint force. Um, the Army Reserve provides the nation with an extremely economical force. We have to achieve required training readiness levels that we're resourced for while only training together 39 days along with our guard counterparts per year. We're resourced to train at the platoon level of proficiency at company echelon. We're structured differently than the regular Army and the Army National Guard in that our brigades are generally separate. They fight separately. They don't have organic units beneath them when they deploy. The same with our battalions. So they focus on tactical exercises without troops or STXs. The Army Reserve needs to be ready enough to enable the fight, but not to the point where our Army Reserve soldiers cannot maintain a civilian career. The Army Reserve prepares for units and soldiers to execute multi-domain operations through a five-year model when not in conflict. The model rotates a unit through 36-month training phase, followed by a 12-month mission phase, if called upon to do so, and if necessary, a 12-month modernization phase. We leverage technology to monitor and assess our organic readiness levels. So our biggest training constraint, as you can see, is time. Therefore, we have to ensure that every moment that we train and we meet has to be relevant and focused. Since we train at platoon level and non commission officers are the primary trainers for most of the training at the bottom of the period, my commanders have to set enough sufficient time 
at the battle assembly, which is or drill, uh, we call it battle assembly for sergeant's time training. Our NCOs need to focus specifically on individual crew and squad level soldiers tasks, battle drills, and individual MOS tasks during battle assembly or weekend drill at the crawl phase. Once a quarter, we meet, potentially do a, a field training exercise, do a walk phase. We meet for a collective exercise once a year, a combat support training exercise for a run phase or a warfighter exercise. We have to assume risk on administrative tasks that turn chiclet green charts, but do little to enhance combat capabilities. We're trying to, uh, dr we're driving our culture to ensure that our junior NCOs are not merely participants on the weekend, that they're empowered and prepared to lead training, which is what they're paid to do. This is the only way that the Army Reserve will stay technically proficient to support multi-domain operations within our limited training constraints. We're also constrained by distance. Our full-time staff, 16,511, must organize training by planning and coordinating for the training resources during the month. This cannot be done by the citizen soldier. They're responsible for execution. The Army Reserve has to digitize the squad lead in order to get the training effect that we need to win an MDO. I've directed every true program unit squad leader to leverage the small unit leader tool to manage their squad's training progression. And every soldier can access the digital job book to view their completed individual training. General Daniels and I both support the Army's efforts to streamline security requirements in order to enable the troop program units, uh, soldiers across the Army to access Army systems through bring your own device. So while we are restricted by time and distance, um, and we face challenges to achieve proficiency to support the force, you can rest assured that when the nation calls, we will be ready for the challenge. Facing adversity and winning is what non-commissioned officers do. And while MDO may change the character of war, the nature of war and how NCOs train, I don't see that changing. So thank you for allowing me to be here today, SMA. I look forward to your questions. All right, team, good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Hey, um, Sergeant Major Hendricks, Training and Doctrine Command. Like this is, this is our wheelhouse, Training and Doctrine. Um, and I just want to kind of hit a few points as we go through this topic, and more importantly, really want to get to the questions because I think that's where the real discussion will happen in this framework. So as we talk about this, and as we look at this slide right here, training time and resources, the average soldier, when you come to Training and Doctrine Command, when you look at our three tenets of those key efforts we're working on, we have responsibility for sessions in recruiting, and I see the, the user XR major sitting out here today. That is clearly a huge effort that is not only just on USREC and TRADOC, but it's really an Army-level effort. We also are turning those citizens into soldiers. So when you think about basic combat training, OSIT, one station unit training, it really falls in the wheelhouse of what TRADOC has responsibility for. And then the third effort is that professional military education that we build throughout your career and in this continuum that at every single rank at Echelon, it'll allow you to be successful in those new responsibilities that we place upon you. But here's a really important piece that I think will be in in a really good discussion point when we talk about 7-0, and most importantly. So we now have new doctrine on the table. We give you an opportunity to see what it is, but you actually come to PME about every three to four years, because this will come up, and I'm really putting this on the table now. I am all about putting things into professional military education to help the force. But if you're getting a touch point on a topic that is critical to your success, Putting it into PME is not going to be the primary thing that allows you to overcome that challenge because you're only getting a touch point about every three to four years. So one of the things we are working on, and about a year ago, myself, the CAC SAR Major, Steve Helton, Jason Smith down at the SAR Majors Academy, we went out and did kind of a tour with the operational force. We sat down with our esteemed gentlemen over here in the, the core CSMs and the divisions, and we laid out what we were doing in the institutional domain and as well as we listened to what some of those issues and challenges were. Some of them we worked on and gotten right. Some of them we still need to keep working on. And others, I think, directly tie into this. So one of the things I'll tell you we're working on right now is the NCO competency assessment. One of the issues that came up 
is how do we get you validated and certified in the doctrine that you should know at Echelon every single year? And so we're working right, that, right now. We've done two pilots. One we just completed at the Fire Center of Excellence. And guess what? We focused on things like FM 7.0. What should you know at your Echelon? FM 3.0, which is coming out. Are those are very specific to your MOS. So we'll have about two more turns at a pilot and then we'll bring it in front of the SMA and the SEC panel members for some recommendations, how we can do a competency assessment where you go on Blackboard once a year and we validate and certify you in those things that are critical to your MOS and your job. We've also just um, completed and started um, a one-week reduction for ALC and SLC. So let me, let me be clear here, and this is for all of your soldiers out there. One week we have taken out of ALC and SLC, and they will do that from home station. And it was really part of two things. We want you to come to PME. We think PME is critical, but we really want to focus on those things face-to-face -face that we know that you must be there in person to do. So we have about a week built in of distance learning. And that week, to make sure we understand for all the leaders in here, they are still at your home station. But from 9 in the morning to about 1,700, they have got to be online with a face-to-face -face instructor for those things that are important. So as we were talking about being in the motor pool, fixing that tank engine, that is not what the SMA is talking about. They have got to be in that class. It is critical as part of that. But what we did want to do is give you a week back of your time when you went to ALC and SLC to basically allow you to be with your family, to allow you to be back with your units and organizations. And so we think that is important, and those are some of the issues that are working. We've just had uh, two classes that we've done with that. We're getting the feedback, and then we'll share that with all the nominative sergeant majors to make sure we're all moving in the right space as well. One of the other key topics that uh, has come out over the last year, we all are fully aware of the, the ACFT, but what has always been the bigger story of the ACFT, holistic health and fitness. Matter of fact, if you hadn't had an opportunity to go down to the floor, there's an incredible setup of the holistic health and fitness effort that CMT has led for the United States Army, but more importantly, it is a camp posting station near you right now. And then over the last few years, we've also upgraded uh, what we are doing in OSIT and AIT, and why this is important, because it really does get to 7-0 when we talk about those training management. As you see right here in that area that's identified in black, it is, you've got to have a foundation that is built with the individual training tasks. And so as we look at OSIT, we went from about 13 weeks to 22, depending on which one you're going to. Phenomenal results, some of the best trained, some of the most fit individuals we've had come out. And I think when I looked at the stats with CMT, it was about 10 years, uh, a phenomenal result with that. And so we're also doing that same effort as we look at 7.0 with BLC and getting into the facts of things like field craft and rigor and getting land navigation and back into our BLC. Now, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that tomorrow, but those are some of the key initiatives as we get a time to talk today about training and resources that uh, really look forward to the discussion points today. So thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Hey, so I want to start off by saying it's awesome to be back at uh, AUSA in full force, and we're really thankful for AUSA for putting this together along with the SMA. So um, the gentlemen to my right have talked to you about what we're doing today. I want to talk to you a little bit about what we think we're going to do in the future. So the future operating environment is going to be uh, critical to have trained units. This will ma maximize our modernization efforts. So AFC's job is to keep an eye on the future. What we believe the future will be informed really by two major efforts, and it will be nested in .mil PFP. So the first thing is our Directorate of Intelligence Services, DOIS, is watching our pacing threats. We're observing the environment, and we're staying on the pulse of the developing technologies. DOIS develops the Army Modernization Intelligence Estimate, which characterizes the future operational environment. From a perspective of technological advancement and how Russia 
and China will wield technology at scale. The second one is our Future Studies Program. The Future Studies Program con is continuous and iterative. It's a war game and it's an experiment that characterizes uh, the changing character of warfare with regard to technologies that mature uh, very rapidly. These war games and experiments emphasize how artificial intelligence, autonomy, robotics, and other technologies will change the character of the war in, future, in the future. So both DOIS and F, uh, the FSP characterized the future war with extreme speed, high lethality, and a transparent battlefield. Future forces will likely operate in radically dispersed formations that rely on mobility, deception, and protection measures. So the increased risk on the future battlefield means that we have to be victorious now. We have to see quickly and decide faster. This is going to require some significant changes in the way we think about things. Think about the battle staff non-commissioned officer who has to interpret data, has to facilitate decisions, has to build trust in the machine and the man team. Future forces are going to operate in more dispersed formations, requiring NCOs to lead forward with greater discretion to wield highly technological, technical and technological tools. Training will remain critical. It's a function of being technically and tactically proficient and having a competent army. NCOs will facilitate this through trust and confidence in technology and the ability to understand how technology can make them more lethal on the battlefield. NCOs will troubleshoot highly technical items of equipment, material that Army Futures Command is going to deliver in the future. And they're going to have to figure out how logistically we fix and fuel that on the battlefield without some FSR located where they're located at the time of need. So what is AFC doing with regard to professional development? So we're leading a constant and more important data-centric look at the Army, building leaders that will, will, will maintain our asymmetric advantage. So we execute some bi-weekly professional development at our headquarters to try to ensure that we understand where technology is going and then we can interject training with that technology. No technology can get us where we need to be if our soldiers are not trained on that piece of technology. They cannot operate it in austere conditions at the tactical edge, at the squad, at the platoon, at the company level. So a couple other things that we're doing, you may or may not have heard of the Army Software Factory. Prototyping future organizations where talent management systems for a digitally literate Army are essential. The software factory has upskilled the ability to do digital and software skills. We are focusing on building a data-centric, data-informed NCO core solving problems at the tactical edge for commanders. The second thing we're doing is the Artificial Intelligence Integration Center with Carnegie Mellon University. Carnegie Mellon University is the number one data science university in the United States, and I believe it's number two in the world. So we are educating soldiers with master's degrees in data science and data engineering. We're also educating soldiers at the AI technician level. This is where we're focusing heavily on non-commissioned officers that are data intelligent, data informed, and can understand that environment with regard to autonomy, robotics, artificial intelligence. And this is going to bring lethality to what uh, I believe Todd described as our division-centric army of the future. So as we move forward, I think it's important that uh, as that's been described, the nature of war is not going to change, but the character of war is going to change. Our NCOs are key in maintaining overmatch. If we don't have overmatch, we can't win. Technology cannot give us complete overmatch. We still have to be cohesive, highly trained, disciplined, fit. We have to understand the environment, and we have to execute it to tactical um, the tactical edge. So we're building an army of 2030, we're designing the army of 2040 with NCOs in mind to solve the problems that technology cannot deliver. The human problem in the equation. So I'm um, glad to be here today and look forward to your questions with regard to what Army Futures Command is doing with building competent NCOs for 2030 and 2040.
Appreciate it. Thanks, panel members. Hey, we have quite a few cards up here already with questions and great questions we have. Uh, some of the questions, we're going to expand them a little bit to uh, get perspective from different components. Uh, there will be no more cards select, uh, picked up by now. If you want to ask a question, just please go to the mics on the outside. So if you would, Sergeant Major Sims, take the first question. Cool. All right. So the age-old question, why do us old grumpy guys want to have land navigation back in PME? All right. <laughs> So I'm going to frame this by telling a story. So young, young special, actually Corporal Sims went to uh, PLDC back in the day, and uh, I'm running, running to my point, and I see uh, Specialist Holhausen laying on the ground crying. I stopped and said, "What's wrong? I do not know how to land navigate." So I took 10 minutes from you know I, I wanted to be the first guy done. I, I wasn't because I took 10 minutes and I taught her how to freaking land navigate. That's how important that is because it doesn't matter where you work. You know, Brian was talking about technology. It's all great until it doesn't work. To enable mission command, it's a skill level one task. We have to be able to move from one point on the ground to another and be there on time. So hence the reason that we kind of, myself and uh, Sergeant Major Hendricks talked about it. Sergeant Major Hendricks talked to all the core Sergeant Majors about it. Why it's so important that we test. It's a test on learning because NCOs inside of force comm formations and whatever formation you're in are supposed to teach our soldiers how to land navigate. And what a better way to t do a test on learning at EIB, ESB, uh, EFMB, but also in PME. That, that's why it's important, because there's nothing worse than when a commander gives you a time and a place to be with a grid on a map and you don't show up. You know, because that, that gets into the commander's uh, OODA loop of not being able to accomplish the mission because our soldiers do not know how to move from one point on the ground to another. So that's, that's kind of a, a, a throwing it out there for you. Uh, but that's the reason why we've pushed so hard to uh, put that back in PME. And I'll pass it off to Dan if he has any more thing to say. So as we talk about large-scale ground combat operations and we talked about the technical aspect of what we've got doing and you name your ability to navigate with those systems, it's awesome. It's incredible. Until you don't have it, which we fully expect to happen, no matter what we're going to do, where you're going to go, you're going to be back to some old, simple things like a protractor and a compass. We've done five pilots so far. On average, 40 to 60 percent failure rate on the basic skill set of land navigation. Now, when we look at implementation, and again, we'll bring this to the, uh, the SMA and the panel, it is not for attrition. Right? There's going to be a time in there where we're really focused on it is about excellence. It is about getting us back in to the, the reps and sets of this thing that is cr critical to the professional soldier that we need to have in all soldiers. It doesn't matter what your MOS is. It doesn't matter what role you're in. We know there is no front battle lines. It is across our framework. And so I think this one is really important of getting it built back in. And then by what I mean by incentivization is like, hey, you're going you're gonna to have to get a go in both day and night land nav if you want to be the distinguished autograd, if you want to make the commandant's list. Those things are important. But there will be some point as we move to uh, in the future um, that might be aligned with attrition, but that's way too early at this point. Yeah, if I, just, just a thought. So, so as it pertains to MDO, like if, if, it's gonna go, if it can go wrong, it's, it's going to go wrong. Right? So what's your backup plan? What's your pace plan? On this, and that's why we need to do this, right? Signs are going to be turned backwards, or they're going to be taken off, right? You have no idea what your near peers' electronic capabilities are, whether your systems are going to even work, right? That's why you have to master the fundamentals, and that's why it's important for NCOs to train the task. Hey, Sergeant Major Rains, if you could take the next question. All right. Hey, uh, next question. As a junior leader, I can't control my time, so how do I prioritize my training? So I. You know, it's what we're talking about today, right? It's uh, it's seven zero. So so when you look at uh, when you look at seven zero, you know, I've been in many meetings at the force com level. You know, with 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 my brother sitting here to my right, with different force com commanders, and, and listening to them jump up and down on tables and, and talk about hey, our responsibility at the base of this pyramid. You know, individual team, squad, platoon, and company. You know, and, and telling us hey, that's where we need you to focus at. You know, that's where we need you to be. You know, we, and especially in the Guard, you know, we can get you where you need to be once the, the mobilization time period happens and you get to the MOB station, as long as you come to us trained at, at that T3 level. So, you know, so 
how is that not getting down from the force comm level to the platoon level, to the company level, to the battalion level? You know, that, that, is, our, that is our question that we got. And I think the SMA hit it right at the beginning when he talked about, hey, read the FM. When it talks about the uh, training management, it talks about how we, uh, how we develop our training plans, there's never should be a, a question that says, hey, I don't have any time to spend with my element. You know, you should always have the time that you can spend with your element. But we know that's true, right? We know that. I think everybody in this room feels a little bit of that pain and feels like they don't have enough time with their element to do training. So I think that's where the education piece comes in. And, and we talk about, hey, how much training we do in the organizational side of the house. But it starts also at the PME side and educating our leaders and letting them know, hey, how do you do training management? How do, you, how do you walk that thing down? And then how do you focus on that piece that NCOs have the responsibility to do, which is train their soldiers, crews, and small teams? We, we have to make priority for that. And if we see our junior leaders struggling with that, and that's the question that they're bringing to us, we have to go and engage with those commanders. And we have to make sure that they understand that, hey, they're not going to be successful at their their bigger collective task if we're not successful at that soldier, uh, crew, small team level. Hey, John, I want to pile on just a little bit to this. Um, so when I think about training at the, the small unit and the collective level, I think about, you know, some of the core C-O-R-E responsibilities of our non-commissioned officers, as, as the SMA talked about with 7-0 and, and John talked about. But I'll start with just the simple things, right? Are we fit? Are we cohesive and care about each other? Have we focused on our MOS requirements at the skill level one and skill level two? Just lay those out. What are they? And oh, by the way, have we asked the next echelon above us what requirements they want us to train? and why. We often just say, okay, my responsibility is to do this, that, and the other, and I think it's what I learned from the guy before me. But, you know, we have training meetings for a reason, to lay out the prioritization of training. And as a, I'll use a squad leader as an example. The squad leader should ask the platoon leader and the platoon sergeant, what are the critical, ta critical tasks associated that I need to train my squad on for us to be successful as a collective unit as a platoon? And many times, Non-commissioned officers do not want to ask that question because they, they don't want to feel like they're inadequate in some kind of way. Um, I would tell you that the gentlemen sitting up here on this panel, we ask questions to each other all the time, to the Sergeant Major of the Army and to our bosses to say, hey, look, what, sir, what do you want us to focus on, right? Or what should we be focused on to make sure that we're ready to fight and win? You know, it's, it, it doesn't really, I, I'm not trying to make it simple, but in the simplest form, MOS tasks, warrior tasks and battle drills, weapons qualification and fitness at the small unit level, those are what's going to make you win on the battlefield. Those things are going to make you win on the battlefield. Don't worry about what they're doing at, at, at the battalion level, all right? You, as a young non-commissioned officer, are not going to solve the battalion commander's problems for him, likely. You can make it harder for him to be able to do, or she, for them to, to do what they need to do, but just focus on the good basics of being fit, being disciplined, being an expert at your, with your weapon system and at your MOS, and, and that will collectively allow the entire organization to do the things that they need to do. Sorry, Major. So I'll read the next uh, six-line doozy. I'm just going to ask the panel for a little bit of help on this one. So it goes something like this. <clears throat> I'm a squad leader in a recent TDA unit uh, with a 24-7, 365 mission. How or when do I find or make the time uh, to train my squad on Army tasks, you know, land nav, weapons, et cetera, in an organization with little or no systems, weapons, or vehicles to train on? Background. My soldiers work on a DA-6 on, a, uh, on an inconsistent schedule, and everyone in my squad has a different time off. Yeah, 
don't, don't be a coward. So, <clears throat> all right, so the squad leader has the responsibility to get their soldiers trained. Uh, but does the squad have to train together, is what my question would be. And um, on any camp post or installation, so I've worked for the United States Army Reserve Command, about 260 some odd soldiers plus another 400 on, on orders, have to train them. So what are the resources on the camp post or station that I can integrate my soldiers with on their time off to maintain the individual tasks? That, that's my thought. Um, I'm not sure, I have a responsibility to do it. I don't know if I need to do it as a squad or if I could put them with another ad hoc organization to get the requirement done to make sure that they're ready. Any other thoughts? Hey, I, I think it's very similar to the last question. You know, where do you, where do you find the time to, to focus on, on the building blocks uh, of, of being a master of your skills? You know, I, I, think, it, I think that's really uh, the question and very similar two questions there back to back. And I think it gets after that, that training management piece. And, and you know, our role in the training management process, you know, as NCOs. So when they're having those training meetings, making sure that we're there, that we're not out taking care of some other kind of stuff, and that we're having input in, into the processes. So therefore, they, they realize what's not getting accomplished and what we're not ready for. And, and sometimes we just got to phrase it in, in that kind uh, of, you know, uh, of overall communications to let them know, hey, we're not going to be ready for the for the bigger, you know, your bigger collective event if, if you don't give us some time to train on our individual stuff. Now, now the difficulty in this one is it's a TDA organization, so we we know the we know uh, TDA organizations and the other missions that we task them with. So I mean, that's the piece that that you have to get it on the training schedule, and then you have to actually follow the training schedule. It can't be something just hanging on the on the bulletin board. Board or, or on some digital platform. It, it, you have to be inventive. All right. Having uh, been in, in an OCT organization that did not have weapons, how do, how did we maintain weapon proficiency? So, as a non-commissioned officer, I reached out to National Guard folks. To, hey, can can we come draw your weapons out so I can qualify my soldiers on on on, a, on the M, M4, M16, whatever it was. But you have to be inventive. You can't just take no for an answer, especially if you're in an organization that, that runs, you know, you're on a DA-6. So how, how, as a non-commissioned officer, can you reach out and use those things? If you're, if you're active duty, OCT and First Army, I'm thinking about, because I was uh, the First Army Sergeant Major, we didn't have weapons. And what, what's worse than a bunch of infantrymen and tankers and 42s? And, and you know, you got to go back to an organization that you're going to have to shoot again. If we can't maintain proficiency, by reaching out to our partners to our left and right, you know, that, that's, it's all about being inventive and making stuff happen. I was a devil when I was a squad leader. You know, we had time. There was time everywhere. Like, people would be playing spades. I would go draw the uh, mortars out, and we'd do crew drills. You know, my squad, like, oh, I want to play spades. No, you're, you're going to be the best freaking uh, pole runners in the freaking uh, Army because you're, you're putting it out 50 and 100 meters, and you're not doing it like, you know, it, it's all about how inventive you are to, as a non-commissioned officer, how can you figure out a way to ensure that you're training your soldiers. It, it, it's, it's all in your head. You can all do it, but if you need help, you always have to you reach up and you reach out to get that help to ensure you're training your people. Sergeant Major Hendricks, your question. All right. We've got a couple questions here. All right, so we got a couple questions. Just, just one, Sergeant Major. <laughs> well, I want to address this one because I don't want to think uh, I'm not – so it, it asks a question about um, holdover, hold under soldiers at training, and then it goes into some other things that seem very personal. And I would ask, if you ask this question, please come find me right after this, because if this is happening with you, I would, I would like to know exactly who it's happening with and where. But here's the short version to that answer. We do not, we will do everything we can in TRADOC not to have holdover hold under populations, bringing folks in, having them sit there, idle hands is never good, ever. Nothing good ever comes of that. And so as we look at those populations and then you may finish AIT and we don't want you held over, right, before you go off to our correction, you finish BCT and we don't want to hang on to you before you go off to uh, AIT. But if you gave this question, please come see me at the back end of this. I, I have a question for you. Okay. And I think uh, this is from our Compo 2 brothers. He said, the new PME training format, right, what first phase is virtual, second phase is resident. It's a pretty short window in between those. It is. So we have a Compo 2 rep 
on the team. We've been working this literally since last October. It is going to be an ugly baby. We're implementing it this month. And Compo 2 and Compo 3 were some of the biggest challenges because this was primarily as we were looking at giving you as much time as possible at home station. And then most importantly, how does that work in Compo 2 and Compo 3? It is not an easy fit. And so we're working through the details of that as we figure that piece out. And as well, you asked the question on the funding. And so that's why we have a Compo 2 and a Compo 3 rep on the team as we're starting to get the feedback of where we're at. And then I actually got online a, a really good point. And as I see most of our senior leaders here that are overseas, please remember when you're overseas and you've got a soldier doing that virtual piece, that may be at oh dark 30 in the morning. So just remember that, that they may not be there at uh, that 6.30 formation call, and just make sure you fully understand that. Compo 2-3, you want to add on to that at all? Good. Okay. Next question. Go ahead. Brian. So, oh, so, if I, so as related to that question, you know, depending on the learning, meth, the learning model for, you know, we use the term virtual. Is it asynchronous or synchronous? And I think that has some relevance for the, for the reserve component soldiers. Uh, for, for us, and at least from my perspective, uh, that soldier needs to be on a, on a duty status while they're performing that virtual training to remove them from any constraint to try to get them to, to have them do, uh, to balance or integrate their civilian job while they're doing this uh, online piece of it. So from, from our components perspective, uh, that's what we would like to see. Just tour tracking. Trey Doc is in full concurrence. Sorry, Major Hester. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Pull the audience real fast here for this next question. So all the nominative Sergeant Majors, please stand up. There is a lot of them in this room. Holy cow. If you got promoted, no, don't, don't clap for them. They got way too much work to do. No, 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 no. Stay standing. If you got promoted at any point from Sergeant First Class to Sergeant Major without completing the step requirement, I want you to keep staying and I want everybody else to sit down. Okay, so we have a handful. So the question is with regard to STEP and the additional challenges with the select, train, educate, and promote. So I asked the SAR majors to stand up as a, as a really cool example of this particular focus, right? Selecting, then training, then educating, and then promoting. And there's a reason why we do that. We want to ensure that you are ready to stand in the formation and lead from the front and understand the requirements that you have with regard to that grade, that position. Now, we all understand that that creates personal challenges um, from time to time. Um, and we're, we're going to continue to take a look at this in detail and make sure that we don't disadvantage people. But the bottom line is, is we have a requirement to be an expert. And professional military education helps us to be an expert and lead in front of those formations. And again, the reason why I had them stand up to show you that is, is we're not asking anybody to do anything that we haven't had to do ourselves. Um, and I know that might sound a little bit harsh. And there are lots of requirements for lots of different people to have to manage uh, going forward. What, uh, what I would say is, is your leaders understand that, and they're going to help you to get through that. But you are going to have to make some, some decisions going forward on, on how you do that from a personal perspective. And then allow, allow us leaders to help you do that. And, and uh, I'll, let, uh, I'll let the trade Oxar major add some additional context with regard to step. Uh, but, you know, we've had, we've had a policy most recently that, uh, that's allowed a, an exception to not have to go to PME. Um, and uh, I think in the future there might be something else other than that. All right, so just real quick. So tomorrow we'll, we'll have the, uh, the SMA's initiatives. This will be a big topic. And so I will not uh, jump in front of that. So we will have that discussion in uh, full totality tomorrow at the, uh, the initiatives forum with the SMA. He did not just pawn a question off, but yeah, cool. 
All right, so uh, the, the question I have is, uh, what advice would you give to a junior mid-grade non-commissioned officer that is well-versed in new doctrine, FM-70, uh, large-scale combat operations, that, that may run into leaders that are stuck in a coin mindset? Um, that's a good one, because there are still folks out there that think we're still fighting coin, and you really see it at the, at, at the training centers, uh, and especially with some, some of our battalion-level sergeants, major, first sergeants, et cetera, uh, they're still, in the, like I, I said in my opening comments, the fighting first sergeant, the fighting sergeant major, uh, negative. Uh, you have to main uh, focus on uh, how you're going to sustain your force. And uh, I'm seeing a good split after two years being the force comm sergeant major. Uh, our battalions and brigades are figuring it out uh, because they, they're actually doing a great job with communicating with each other. But I, I think uh, thinking about this, I go way back. I, I think you heard SMA talk about this. Uh, uh, I used to write questions up on my platoon board, and they were doctoring questions. In order for somebody to get, you know, at, at the end of the day or get off early, they would have to answer that doctoring question. Then, uh, first, Cav, where are you at? What's that? Uh, what's the troop you stood up? The, the, the Pegasus troop. All right. So what they do is they have this thing. It's called the Yellow Book. It's standards. In order for a person, correct me if I'm wrong, Shade. In order for the person to graduate from that, they have to pass a test, right? All right, so what, what a lot of folks do, which is great. I mean, I, I see some of my mentors back there. I think uh, I see John Sampa back there. I see Bernie Knight. And I, I see former SMAs. I mean, it's, it's great at a battalion level when you have a leader development program or a brigade level. But, you know, what you have to do is focus on what your metal task is. It's awesome to have, uh, you know, Bernie Knight come and talk to your guys or Sergeant Major Chris Greca. You know, it, it, it's, it's cool, but is that focused on what your metal task is? So, you know, I think advice is, uh, I remember taking tests, my platoon sergeants would like, uh, like write a test out and we'd have to take that darn thing. You know, I'm not saying that Dan Hendricks gonna bring the SQT back or, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, you know, in order to help them understand the importance of our doctrine, test them on it. Um, and, and I know it's easier and said and done than the SVABs, but, you know, if you have that problem, and we, can, we can fix it. I don't know where, where's Don. Ferguson. Ah, we can fix it. Who will? SMA. Sergeant Major Sims. I know it's like, it's really bad, right? Um, can you give one example, though, of what do you mean by the difference between a fighting first sergeant, just one, and, the, and what you want them to do in a large-scale combat? Because maybe they've not. Ex so who came in? Raise your hand if you came in the Army after 2001. Now, there's more. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> You're just not raising your hand hard enough. So can you give, to clarify, sure. you said it twice. Right. But if you could give one example of what you're seeing at NTC and okay. GTC, I think that'd be Roger, SMA. So, uh, so in, in the coin environment, I, I, I fought through this. Uh, before, you know, we were focused on large-scale combat operations. As a first sergeant, I was in the, the CTCP or back in the BSA, like form, 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 making sure our formations had what they need forward. All right. But... So what we're seeing, not, not as much anymore, is uh, you know, during COIN, the first sergeant and the commander usually travel together. The battalion sergeant major, like I'm, I'm, I'm speaking specific to a striker organization now, like I rode in a striker. That was not my striker. That was the Air Force's striker. All right, so they had a specific mission set they were supposed to provide our commander, but sergeant's major would take those vehicles over and go on patrol. Um, so it, that's... That's not what the focus of the first or the first sergeant or the sergeant major need to be, you know. So now I'm seeing when I see a striker formation out at uh, at the at the national training center or even a, a first sergeant and uh or a sergeant major at uh, JRTC is they're not tethered to the commander. I mean, it's good if you go have a touch point with the commander, but you have to go out. You know, they call it the point of friction. Uh, but anyway, thinking about this and watching what the fight is unfolding at both our training centers, that the focus is sustaining, sustaining that battalion, sustaining that company. Um, and that subtle switch going to back to how we used to train uh, before the coin operations is uh, wh where we need to focus our efforts to ensure that our sergeants major and our first sergeants, our platoon sergeants are understanding they have to sustain that force. Um, like I used to always say, I was an armored brigade sergeant major, infantry guy, right? At 72 hours and one minute, every one of those tanks and Bradleys are gonna run out of fuel and run out of bullets and they're gonna be a bunch of infantrymen, and, which is fine by me because I'm an infantry guy. However, comma, I, I want the lethality of that tank and that Bradley 
So I had to ensure as that brigade sergeant major and all my battalion sergeant majors had to ensure that, hey, those things were getting fixed, those things were getting fueled, those things had ammo. Uh, that, that's what I, that, is that, is that good SMA? Cool. Go ahead. Sergeant Majors. Sergeant Major Macri, 10th Army Air Missile Defense Command out of Europe. And so I think we look at multi-domain operation, large-scale combat operations, um, and thinking about training as we fight in the future with some of the, the capabilities coming out. I think we all agree that it's going to be a joint and combined fight uh, when it's time to go to war. So I guess the question is, is, you know, what's your take on how we get joint training opportunities and, and, and uh, down into the the junior enlisted soldiers earlier on. Uh, I know for me, the first time I really thought about joining was when I went to SAR major course and, and got the class there. So I, I think if we think about the joint fight uh, and in the future, how do we get that knowledge down to the lower levels earlier on? Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to answer that question. So. Um, I think you know there there are several opportunities for assignment in the joint force, um, but what I don't think that we do a very good job uh, across the entire force. Um, we're we're a bit parochial, right? We want to keep our best people in our army. We want them doing the things that, the, that our army needs them to do on a day-to-day -day basis, and we may be uh, less than excited about sending them out to to the joint force to um, to be broadened with regard to how the joint force operates. Um, but there are, there are going to consistently be opportunities to do that, and we, we as non-commissioned officers got to look for our best, our best and brightest young non-commissioned officers that may sit uh, in this room someday, maybe even at this head table, and they have to have those experiences. We are not going to fight by ourselves. We are going to fight as a joint and combined force. And, you know, the joint doctrine is, is slightly different than our Army doctrine, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, our responsibility is to be lethal at the point of attack. Um, both as non-commissioned officers and, and broadly as an army. So, uh, so opportunities for joint assignments are, are critical. Uh, they're critical at the junior NCO level. They're also critical at the senior non-commissioned officer level. Um, but but uh, I would just say that that um, as a as a body up here, I don't know that we can manage that and say you must have these joint opportunities throughout your development for you to be able to do what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, interacting with the joint force. Um, it's an education and experience thing, uh, but it's also, you just have to acknowledge the fact that it is a joint and combined uh, force that we're gonna work within, and you can't be parochial with regard to the, how the Air Force might do things, or how the Navy might do things, or how the Marine Corps might do things. It's really about how does the, how does the U.S. service member fight and win? And, and we enable that as non-commissioned officers throughout the joint force and within our own army. <clears throat> I don't know that I can really answer your question. I can just give you some context. So I, I think what we could improve upon as well is not just joint training, but, but component integration for training. I think we have an opportunity to do that um, at CTC exercises. Um, I certainly would like to see some of my reserve component elements, uh, enablers, uh, help, help the maneuver units out of this. So, so my push is to get significant amounts of reserve enablers to, uh, to help the, the total force. Okay, I got the next question. I think we're uh, closing in on time here. So uh, does the modernization process include the understanding of trying to train and sustain? The, the simple answer to that is yes. The dot mill PFP, takes into consideration all things with regard to the modernization process. Um, if you've been paying attention to the news recently, um, we all believe that our six modernization priorities are right. Think about the things that you see in Ukraine with, uh, with regard to fighting with fires. Think about the things uh, with regard to sustainment. Uh, so we, we absolutely take into consideration when you think about DOTML PFP with regard to training, leader education, organizations, Doctrine, we're doing this with CAC, we're doing this with, with TRADOC, and we're doing this with FORCECOM. Look, the, the modernization enterprises, all these folks are sitting up here, to include USASOC. All right? It's not just Army Futures Command. It's the ACOMs, it's the ASCCs, it's the CORES. Right? We may, we may have the responsibility from a poster perspective, but... It, it's all the major commands and the Army's responsibility with regard to the modernization process. 
The other part of this is, is most folks think about the modernization process with regard to only materiel. They think about the tank. They think about the howitzer. They think about the radio. They think about the weapon. They think about the IVAS. That's just a, frankly, that's a very small part of what we do with regard to modernization and the, the, the time to train and the time to sustain that. It is the entire process, right? From the threat, identifying the threat, to the prototype, to the limited rate production, to the testing, to the full rate production, to passing it off to AMC to sustain and then, and then uh, divest of. So yes, we are thinking about training and sustaining throughout that entire um, life cycle of any piece of material in the Army and any soldier or item uh, that, that's, uh, that's available for us to put at the pointy end of the spear. Thank you. Sir Major Reigns. Hey, um, you know, when I, I'm sitting here looking at a question in front of me now, and I'm thinking about the questions we've already asked and some of the comments, and, and when I look in front of me and I'm looking at the pyramid, you know, a lot of it comes down to, to resources, you know, whether it be money, whether it be people, whether it be time, it comes down to resources and, and how we manage those resources. So when I look at that pyramid and, and I sit there and I look at it, that, that's an example, right? 5% at the top, you know, what's it say at the bottom? 40% at the bottom, that's an example. Who, who's gonna make those decisions? Commanders are gonna make those decisions, but we know where we need to be focused on is, is that, that building block, that bottom from the NCO perspective. We need to be, what resources we get is what we're gonna get. So I'm looking at a question in front of me that deals with TRIT, and it looks at a 30% delta versus requirements in TRIT, which is your training dollars, your school dollars. Same thing. You know, you're going to get what you get, and you got to prioritize. And, you know, and you got to be in commander's ears as NCOs to make sure that, hey, uh, you're, uh, you're part of that, uh, which is soldiers, uh, crews, and small teams are being prioritized in that equation, and that we're also uh, not forgetting that we're going into a new doctrine, so we're going to have to educate the force. So how are we going to educate the force? We're going to do it through our schoolhouses, right? We're going to do it through self-learning, and, and we're going to do it at the organizational level. That, that's how we're going to train and educate our, our forces in, in those ways. So where are we going to spend the majority of that time? We're going to spend it in our organizations, you know, in our squads, platoons, companies. That's where we spend it at. That's where we need to become master uh, of our craft and master of our skills at. And we just got to make sure that we're being good stewards of those resources because we never know uh, where we're going to be, where the ebb and flow is going to be. Are we going to be short? We're always going to be short something. You know, so we have to figure it out, and we have to help commanders figure that out and do our piece in, in, in figuring out those priorities and where we place, you know, ourselves against those resources. Go ahead. Uh, Steve Bain in military.com. Uh, this is for the uh, COPO 2 and 3 leaders um, with, with mandatory.